Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it this day. It is being written in our heart and mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be doers of it. We thank you for all that you're bringing forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're going to begin to share with you today on the subject of how to enter into the eternal life of God. How to enter into the eternal life of God. It's a very important subject. People have totally misunderstood this subject because they thought once they're born again, they're in eternal life and it's all set forever and there's nothing more that they need to do. Not so, as you will see according to the scriptures. Revelation 22, 14, that we begin with, tells you right off the bat. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. When we talk about doing his commandments, we're talking about doing his New Testament commandments. And this particular word happens to be in the present tense, denoting continuous repeated action. As you and I are continually doing the commandments of the Lord, that's what's necessary that they may have right. Actually, this isn't even a good translation where it says may have right, uh, right here. Because this particular word may have makes you think that it's somewhat conditional, but actually the statement is a future tense verb. And it literally says, as Young says, that blessed are those that do are doing his commandments, that they sh shall have the right, or it shall be their right or authority, more literally, to the tree of life. When you are a doer of the commandments of God, you are following his ways, you shall have right or authority, as this means, to the tree of life. And when you partake of the tree of life, you eat forever in that state, as you will abide in eternal life with the Lord. And then it says that they may enter in. Now this part does say the fact that we have a conditional statement, because it's all conditioned upon us doing what he says. This is a subjunctive mood verb, so it's correct here, where it says that we may or might enter in through the gates into the city. What's the condition for us to gate, enter into the gates? Doing his commandments. Now, what does that tell us right off the bat? It's not just getting your ticket to heaven and then I, all of a sudden I've got eternal life. No, it's doing his commandments, walking the walk. That so that we then shall have the right or shall be having the authority to the tree of life and we meet the conditions we can enter into the gates into the city which is talking about the holy city of the new jerusalem we must understand what the word says about how we enter into the eternal life of god well, what is life life is spiritual it's not just something that's natural spiritual life comes from god we see how this happened when God formed man from the dust of the ground. And it says here in verse 2, in verse 7, chapter 2 of Genesis, Genesis 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He breathed in this breath of life. And this was the spirit that came into him. The spirit of, came into man, and now he became a living soul. You and I are made of three parts spirit soul and body without the spirit our body's dead we have no life the spirit is the life and it comes from god now he planted a garden eastward in eden put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground <coughs> he made the lord god that grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food and the tree of life was in the midst of the garden which they were to partake of and live forever in the life of god with a state in the fellowship of the lord but there also was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, they were told they were not to partake of that, as we see that God was to told him that he was supposed to, uh, in the garden, to guard it, keep or guard the way of it. He had to guard it from intruders. And he said that he could eat of all the trees of the garden freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he was not to eat thereof. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, he would surely die. After the temptation came and man ate of it, what happened? He died that day. How did he die? He didn't die physically because Adam lived 930 years. He died spiritually. He was separated from God. He had no more life with God. He now was separated. He still had a spirit, but his spirit was dead unto God. His spirit died as far as separation from God. It didn't cease to exist, but it no longer was in line with God. Well, 
That's why everybody's got to get born again, because we've got to get a brand new spirit. That's the only way we can be reconciled unto the Father. Well, we come down here after uh, the discussion was made after the fall of man with the man and the woman and the serpent. And we come down to verse 22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man's become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, that's an important point. When you partake of the tree of life, you will eat forever in that state. You can only partake of the tree of life when you're right with God to live in that state of being right with God forever. These guys were not right with God any longer. Because notice it says they would live forever in that state. What state? Spiritually dead and separated from God. So what did God do then? So the Lord sent him forth, forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. He drove the man out. He drove him out and placed the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned everywhere to keep or guard the way of the tree of life so that man could not get to it until he came to the place of being born again and reconciled unto the Father. Now, so we get, we come into, back into a situation of having life in us spiritually the day we get born again. But that's, there's more to entering into eternal life than just getting born again. We even see a scripture over in John 17 and verse 3, which says, This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Life eternal is coming into fellowship and knowing the Father and knowing Jesus Christ and walking with him. The only way you can do that is through his word, as you hear and do his word and walk in his ways. And we cannot walk in ways contrary to it, or we will not know him. Instead, we again will allow the enemy to have place in our life. Well, where does this come from? Well, we see that life comes from the Lord. In John chapter 1, in verse 4, the Bible says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Life comes from the Lord. That's where it comes from. And we see what, did, what was the answer for man in that spiritually dead state. Somebody had to come and accomplish the redemption. Who was that? That was Jesus. Jesus was the Word who was made flesh, who came from heaven, the second person the Godhead, who came and took upon himself like sinful flesh to walk the walk that Adam had failed and to bring forth the redemption. In John 3, 15, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish or be destroyed, but have eternal life. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting when it says here about should not perish. This shows you that if we don't believe on the Lord, we actually cause our own problem where it says here about not uh, perishing. This happens to be not only a subjunctive mood, meaning it's conditional. If you don't believe in him, you'll end up being, you'll perish or be destroyed. But it's also interesting that it says it's in the middle voice in the Greek. That means that you will be doing this to yourself because if you do not believe on Jesus, you reject him, you're actually destroying yourself because eternal life is available through Jesus Christ, but instead we are going to end up being destroyed and we're actually doing it to ourselves by rejecting him. But if we do believe on him, what are we going to do? We're going to have eternal life. So the answer, of course, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Same word. as happens to be the exact same tenses of the verb there. So we see Eris, the middle voice and the subjunctive mood, that whosoever believes in him might not perish or destroy himself, literally, but he will have everlasting life. Now, how's this going to come? It's going to come through Jesus, but how does Jesus manifest himself so that we can enter into the eternal life? Well, in John chapter 6, in verse 63, Jesus makes this statement. He says, It's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What's going to bring spirit and life to us? It is the word of God. God's word is spirit and God's word is life. And it will produce eternal life in us as we walk in line with the ways of the word of God. In fact, in verse 68, Simon said, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. 
the spoken words that bring forth eternal life. God's word is what is going to produce eternal life in you. Now, how are we going to get it? We've already seen that we need to do the commandments of the Lord, and it was shown to be something that was conditional to enter into the holy city by doing the commandments of the Lord to be able to partake of the tree of life. Therefore, we must see what the Word says of how you and I are going to be able to possess this and enter into the eternal life of God. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 30, over in verse 19, it says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Notice, it's something that you're going to choose. It's not something that just you got only and then you can just do whatever you want to do. You're going to choose this because if you don't choose life, you could choose death. You could choose cursing instead of the way of blessing. So, in order to enter into it, you've got to make the right choice. You've got to set your will that you are going to choose life. And we see further about this over in Psalm 16. Psalm 16 and verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, in thy right hand there pleasures forevermore. There's a path of life. Otherwise, we just can't walk our own way. You've got to walk the path that God has set for you if you're going to enter into life. And you're going to walk this out step by step as you follow the way of the Lord. We see in Psalms chapter 30, over in verse 5, here he says, For his anger endureth for a moment, in his favor is life. So how else are we going to see the life of God come? We can't do it our own self by our own works or anything, apart from what God's doing, it's not going to happen. It's the favor of God. And how does the favor of God come to us? Through His Word as we walk in the ways of the Lord. In His favor, when you have favor with God, you are going to see that life is going to be manifest as you're walking in His ways. We also see that this life, where does it come from? It comes from within as God is coming on the inside of you through His Word. Psalms 36 verse 9 says, with thee is the fountain of life. Life is like a fountain. What's a fountain do? It comes up from within something and comes up from to affect the person. And that's what happens with us. It's coming from the spirit and from our heart. We have a new heart and we get born again where the word is in our heart. It is spiritual life that is coming up like a fountain from the inside of you. Well, that means we've got to get the word in us, of course, in order to have this fountain to come out of us. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18, it says, She, talking about wisdom here, is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that attain, retaineth her. Otherwise, wisdom that we're going to get, we're going to lay hold upon it. How do we lay hold upon it? By doing what the Word says. As you walk in the light of the knowledge of God, it imparts understanding to you, and as you continue in it, you'll gain wisdom and you'll receive wisdom from the Word of God that you're going to lay hold upon. And it says, happy is everyone that retaineth her. God wants you to retain the wisdom of God, because what's this going to produce for you? A tree of life. Notice, the life is a tree of life that is going to come into you, and a tree starts from the roots, and it comes up and it branches out with all kinds of fruit. That's exactly what is going to happen in your life through the Word in you. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22, lets us know, about the word, as we see, we go back to verse 20. He says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. You've got to guard them because the devil will try to take it out. They are life. The words are life unto those that find them. That means you've got to be seeking after it. When you seek for it, by studying the word and hearing and doing the word, you'll find it and also will produce health to all their flesh. God's Word is life, and it will also produce health to you, but we must seek after it. In Proverbs chapter 6, we see over in verse 20, where it says, We're to keep the Father's commandment, forsake not the law of thy mother, bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. And when thou goest, it shall lead you. The Word's going to lead you. When you sleep, it'll keep you or guard you. And when you awake, it shall talk with you. If you have the Word in you, it will lead you, it will keep you, and it will talk with you. Scriptures will come up to you. That's the Lord talking to you as He's bringing His Word up to you. For the commandment is a lamp, 
and the law is light. And the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. That tells us again, there's a path or a way of life. A way that you and I are to walk in that's going to enable us to enter into eternal life. Notice the reproofs. This is the correction. The re correction of God's discipline, His chastening in our life through correcting us to bring us in line with His Word. That's an important point. If you're going to be in the way of life, you've got to be correctable, receptive to the Word of God, and be willing to have your repentance shoes on to change and to walk in the ways of the Word of God. We see in Proverbs chapter 8, and the proverb has many things that talk about things that are important for us to obtain and enter into eternal life. In Proverbs chapter 8, <coughs> in verse 35, Whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. How do you find him? God and the Word are one. You study the Word, you hear the Word, you do what the Word says, you're finding him, you're walking in his ways as you do it, you're going to find life, and, of course, you're going to get the favor of the Lord. At the same time, as this life is coming in you through the Word, it is also supposed to be released out of you to affect your life and the lives of others. Proverbs 10.11 says, The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. Otherwise, this life that comes into you through the Word is now going to be released out of you like a well coming out of the inside of you with your mouth. With your mouth, you're going to speak things into being. You're going to speak the Word of God. Remember, Jesus was upholding all things by the spoken Word of His power. So you're going to speak, and this isn't coming from your mind. This is going to come from the Word in your heart that you're going to speak and release it out, and it's going to be releasing a well of life out of the inside of you. Over in verse 16, the labor of the righteous tends to life as well. This labor means work. This means you and I are to be working and serving God. That also tends to life because he expects us to serve the Lord and walk in the ways of the Lord if we're going to enter into life because he's all given us a ministry and we are commanded to carry out the ministry of the Lord and preach the gospel and cast out the demons and heal the sick and minister the word of God to people. We see in verse 17, he is in the way of life that keeps instruction or guards or observes the discipline and the chastening or the correction of the Lord. So we want to be receiving that. It says the one who refuses any kind of reproof or correction, he errs. He's making a mistake. That's why always be correctable. That is so important. Pride doesn't want to be corrected. You know, religious tradition doesn't want to be corrected. Know-it-all spirits don't want to be corrected. No, we've got to be willing to be corrected and look at the Word of God so we will stay in the way of life. In Proverbs chapter 11, this Proverbs has much here about principles about how we enter into it. Proverbs 11:19 says, As righteousness tends to life. How are we going to enter into eternal life? It has to be according to righteousness. We're going to have to walk in God's way of righteousness. In fact, in over Proverbs 12, it even calls it the way of righteousness that brings life. Proverbs 12, 28, in the way of righteousness is life. So it's a way. We're going to do his word of righteousness consistently, and we're going to see the life of God be manifest in us. Also, as you are doing it, we've already seen one scripture that referred to fruit, but here we see it again, Proverbs 11:30, The fruit of of the righteous is a tree of life. As you are walking in line with the Word, you bring forth the fruits of righteousness, as it speaks in the New Testament. And what's that going to do? That's going to produce this tree of life. He wants fruit in every area of your life. It's actually a tree of life coming from the Word of God on the inside of you. Another scripture, though, it's important about our mouth. We talked about how our mouth will be like a well of life that will release things, but also you've got to guard your mouth. Proverbs 13.3 tells us something. He that keepeth, or this particular word is a word notsar, which means to, really to watch over. He who watches over his mouth keeps, and this is the word shamar, which means to guard it. In other words, if you're watching over your mouth, watching what it speaks, then you are guarding or keeping your life. But the one who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. That means that you've got to watch the words of your mouth. 
your mouth is to release this well of life out of you, but you also got to realize that you can cause destruction to come by speaking wrong words. That's why we got to watch over our mouth and be sure we're only speaking the things that God wants, and then we will keep or guard our life. Also, as you are doing the Word of God and you're seeing the fruit of it come forth, you're going to see the desires in your heart come to pass. And it says in Proverbs 13, 12, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire cometh or comes to pass, is what this is referring to, it is a tree of life. In other words, your desires come from the word, which is hope. Hope deferred means that you haven't seen any results. Well, that's not going to be a tree of life. But when it comes to pass, when it comes into manifestation, it is going to be a tree of life. God wants to bring all of our hopes into manifestation through acting on the Word of God. We also see in verse 14, it tells us something else. The law of the wise is a fountain of life. We see this phrase, fountain of life, or a wellspring of life. You'll see later different scriptures that show that this life is coming out of the inside of us. It's got to be deposited in us, and it's got to come out of us. The law of the wise will be a, like a fountain of life that continues to bring life to you. Well, the law is the Word of God. Who's the one who's wise? The one who's been applying it and doing the Word and gained wisdom by the application of it of his life because this is the way he walks at all times. We see something else in Proverbs 14, in verse 27. He says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Again, many things that are said to be the fountain of life. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The law of the wise is a fountain of life. We see these things means that when you have the fear of the Lord, then the life of God can come out of you. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from any kind of evil or, way, or ways of wickedness, or it says depart here from the snares of death, which comes because of sin, because the wages of sin is death. That means we got to stay away from sin. Sin's going to bring death. Instead, we're going to walk in the way of the Word, and the fear of the Lord will keep us from walking contrary to the way of the Word and we, then it will be a fountain of life coming out of us. Also, God wants you to get healed in your heart. You know, Jesus comes to heal the broken heart, and he wants you to get healed of anything that has caused wounding or damage in your heart. It says in Proverbs 14.30, a sound heart, this word sound actually means a healed or healthy heart. A healed or healthy heart, we're talking about the inner man on the inside of you, is the life of the flesh. That's what God wants. He wants you to have a healed heart. Envy will cause the rottenness of the bones. It'll damage. That's why you can't let envy, resentments, bitterness, anger, hatred, unforgiveness, these kinds get a hold of you. It'll start affecting you. People with arthritis oftentimes is because of unforgiveness, uh, envy. These kind of things will affect your bones. It'll affect you in your body. See, life is spiritual, and this is affecting you adversely. So God wants you to have a healed heart. That means you've got to deal with everything. You've got to rid of, get rid of all the doubt, the unbelief out of your heart. Any sadness, hurts and wounds, damaged emotions, these things that have affected you. He wants you to get healed. That's why deliverance is so important. And repentance and walking in line with the Word of God so we're consistent in doing what it says. We also see about our tongue, it even says another thing in Proverbs 15.4. A wholesome tongue or a healed tongue or a healthy tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness, meaning I'm speaking wrong things, is a breach in the spirit. It brings a break in the spirit. And what happens when there's a break in the spirit? Satan has entrance because we have brought the hedge down. A breach causes a hedge to be down, a break, because we've opened the door to the enemy. Again, that's why we've got to watch the words of our mouth. It's going to be a tree of life, so your words are going to bring forth all this fruit and all these promises and all these blessings. That tree of life is going to produce in all these different areas of your life. Also, in verse 24, it says, The way of life is above to the wise. Are we walking according to the course of this world? No. Are we walking according to the flesh? No. Are we walking in the natural according to our soul realm directed life? What I feel, what I think, what I want to do? No. We're walking according to the way above because you and I are citizens of heaven. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Meaning if he doesn't walk away the ways of above, he's going to end up in hell beneath. No, we're going to walk according to the ways above 
which is according to the ways of the Word of God. In verse 31, the ear that hears reproof, again, the rebuke of life, abides among the wise. We've seen this is the third time we've seen about being correctable. Again, that's so important. Be correctable, be teachable, get rid of the pride, always be receptive to the truth, and don't be following the traditions of men or just doing whatever you want to do. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 15, tells us something else. In the light of the king's countenance, countenance refers to his face, is life, and his favor is the cloud of the latter rain. That's like the spring rain pouring out upon you. The favor will come. In the light of the king's countenance, that means that's the presence of God being manifested, is going to be light. As you enter into the presence of God through praise, through worship, through the word, through, through praying in tongues, through ministering unto the Lord, through abiding in Him, that is going to produce life. Again, there's many things that are all involved in us entering into the life that God has for us. In verse 22, understanding is a wellspring. This word wellspring is the same thing as like a fountain. Same word where we saw the fountain of life. It's like a fountain or a wellspring of life unto him that has it. You got to get it. Notice it says to him that has it. Now how do you get it? Remember that you get knowledge from hearing the word revealed to you. You act upon that and it produce, produces understanding, spiritual understanding imparted to you because you do the word. As you walk in it consistently, then that will produce wisdom in your life. So the guy who has understanding is one who has it because he's been doing the word. And because he's doing the word, that produces a wellspring of life because where's the life coming? From the inside, and what's the source of it? The word that comes into us, that brought understanding. So as the word's in your heart and you're doing it, that will produce a fountain or wellspring of life coming out of you because of spiritual understanding. Now we come to another one that deals with our tongue. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You and I can release life or we can release death. Again, this is why your words are so important. Watch the words that you speak. We want to speak the right words. And we see another one over in Proverbs 19 again about the fear of the Lord, where he comes along and he says, the fear of the Lord tends to life. You want to see God's life? We got to have the fear of the Lord. Notice what it goes on and says, he that has it, he that has the fear of the Lord is producing life in him. He shall abide satisfied. You should be satisfied in life. You should be abiding satisfied, not all uh, uh, discontent. No, we should be abiding satisfied in things. He shall not be visited with evil. That means no more evil is going to come upon us because we're not walking in the way of sin. We hate evil. We turn away from it. The fear of the Lord is before us. And, of course, the fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge, beginning of wisdom, as the Bible says. So we're walking in line with the Word, gaining knowledge, understanding, and it's producing wisdom in our life. The Bible says you won't be visited with evil. That means the devil will not be able to get to you because of the life of God being manifest. Another thing that we see in Proverbs is in many scriptures we've seen that point out very important principles for us to enter into life. Proverbs 21, 21. He that follows after righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. Otherwise, as we follow after righteousness, that produces righteousness. Remember, the one who do, does righteousness consistently it, he's the one who's righteous because it produces that in his life. He's going to produce the life of God, and he's also going to be honored by the Lord. Therefore, we can't have any unrighteousness in us. That's what produces, is produced by sin. We cannot be walking in the ways of the flesh or the ways of the world. We cannot allow any of those things to come in because that's not following after righteousness and the way of the Lord. We're also going to follow after the way of mercy. We're going to show mercy. The one who shows mercy is going to obtain mercy. And we're going to walk in the ways of the Lord. We're going to find life. One more in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 22, in verse 4, where it says, By humility, got to deal with pride, got to be humble. And the fear of the Lord, what does that produce? Riches and honor and life. Again, we want God's riches. We're not talking about man's riches. We're talking about God's riches and his honor and his spiritual eternal life that will be manifest. Now, over in the New Testament, we see many scriptures that tell us much 
about how, what it is necessary to enter into eternal life. Matthew chapter 7 tells us right off the bat that this is a narrow way and only a few people are entering into it. That should wake us all up. We want to be sure we're one of the few, not one of the many. Look what it says in Matthew 7, 13. Enter you in at the straight gate, which is really the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. It says many are going this way of destruction because they're not walking the straight, narrow way. He goes on and says, because straight or narrow is the gate, and this way narrow here is really not the word for narrow, it's a word pressed. It's a word thlebo, a way of pressed, where there will be affliction or pressure that will come against you is the way. Why? Because what's the narrow way? The way of the word. When you walk in the way of the word, what's going to happen? The enemy is going to come against you, pressing you, trying to take the word out, trying to get you to back off the word of God. So it will be a pressed way that you're going to go through. You're not going to give place to him. You're going to resist him, and he'll flee from you. But nonetheless, you will have pressure. Remember that scripture we looked at in Acts uh, 14.22, where through much pressure or tribulation, pressure, we will enter into the kingdom of God which is the rule and the reign of God. Notice what he says. Narrow is this gate and pressed is this way that leads to life and few there be that find it. That's quite a statement. Few. We want to be sure that we're one of the many, excuse me, one of the few and not one of the many. The many are in trouble. The few are walking the straight and narrow way. That's why we've got to be people of the Word that are going to hear and do the Word and walk in the way of the Word, which is the way of the Spirit. In Matthew chapter 16, we see in verse 24 that Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will, the King James says, will come after me, but we pointed this out before, but if you didn't hear this, the word will is the main verb here. It is in the indicative mood, which is the mood of reality, it is a present tense verb, meaning the person who is willing, continually willing. The word come is actually an infinitive in the Greek. It's an infinitive, which we would translate to come. That's why Young's correctly translates this, if any does will to come after me. In other words, he sets his will to come after me. And of course, we've got to set our will to come after him if we're going to enter into anything that he has for us. What's the first thing we got to do? After setting our will to come after him, we got to do more than that. We got to deny ourself. We cannot to continue to walk in our ways. We must take up our cross, which is the crucifying of the flesh. In Luke 9, it talks about taking up your cross daily, which is the crucifying of the flesh daily, putting to death the deeds of the body. And so that's dealing with the flesh. We're not going to let the flesh run us. And we're going to follow me. How do we follow Jesus? By following his word, doing what his word says. And then he says something else. He says, Whoever will, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. What's he talking about here? Well, we've got to look up these words. When it talks about the life here, this is not the zoe life, the life of God. This is the suke, is the Greek word, which refers to the soul realm life the soul realm directed life. Whoever will save or keep <coughs> his soul realm life, otherwise he's running things from his soul realm, he's going to lose it. The word lose is this word apolemy, which actually means to destroy it. He's going to destroy it. But whosoever will destroy his soul realm directed life, is what it's talking about, for my sake he shall find it. Because where is life going to come into your soul that's going to be right, the right kind of life? It's going to come from God, from His Word, from the Spirit. That's why as you walk after the Spirit, you'll have life. It'll produce life in your soul from God. It'll be life to all those that find Him and health to their flesh, remember? It'll affect you in your physical body. But if you try to run from your, your life from your soul, you'll destroy it. What's your soul made up of? Your will, your intellect, your emotions. Can I choose to do what I want to do without considering God's Word in the way of the Spirit? No. Can I walk according to my emotions, what I feel? No, that's the voice of the flesh. Can I walk according to what I think and my reasoning, how I figure what I want to do? No. I've got to submit my mind to the Word of God and put the Word of God first place. 
Therefore, we need to do some important things. We've got to have our will set to come after him. We're going to deny ourselves. We're going to crucify this flesh daily to shut down all the things of the body. And we're not about to let our soul direct our life. Instead, we're going to walk in the way of the Spirit after the way of the Word of God. Now we see over in Matthew chapter 18 quite a statement made in verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. That's quite a statement. Again, what are we talking about? When we talk about entering into life, this isn't talking about us now. We're talking about in the life to come because you're, if you're cast in everlasting fire, that's the result after you finished your days. This is talking about entering into eternal life with God in the life to come. So what's he saying? If you've got something that's offending you, what would, be, what would a, a hand or a foot one of your members? It means if one of your members are offending you, how would they be offending you? Because you're yielding them to sin. You can't be yielding your members to sin. It says cut them off or cast them from you. Now, are we supposed to literally do that? No. God wants us just to repent and turn away from our sin. But he's even saying if you can't stop this, it would be better for you to cut it off so you can enter into life than having two hands or two feet continually sinning entering into everlasting fire, being cast into it. That's important. That means we've got to deal with the sin in our life if we're going to enter into eternal life. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Guard your eyes. You don't want your eyes to be seeing all these evil things. Cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Again, it's implying if our, our members are being yielded to sin, we're in trouble. We're going to end up being cast into the fire. But instead of what we want to do, we want to confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. He can remember, he'll forgive, forgive you of all your sins, your sins and iniquities. He'll remember no more. And then you repent and walk in the ways of the Lord. And therefore, you will walk in his ways and you'll be able to enter into life. But this is talking about entering into the life to come. Another thing we see in Matthew chapter 19 is we're seeing very important principles laid out in the word of God for how we enter into eternal life. And it's an entering in. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. <clears throat> Here's one who came and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So, he's speaking this so I may continually have. And he understands that it is a conditional thing because it's a subjunctive mood statement. So what good thing shall I do so that I might be able to uh, have this continual in enter, uh, eternal life. He said to him, Why callest thee now good? There's none good but one, that is God. If thou wilt enter into life, what's the answer? Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Do we keep the Old Testament commandments today? No. Do we keep commandments? Yes. What commandments? The, the New Testament commandments, which is the law of the New Testament. That's why it's imperative to know the two New Testament commandments and to keep them consistently in our life. He goes on and says, he said him which, and he tells him all these ones, and he comes down here uh, in verse 21, he says, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. What was the problem? Riches had a hold of him. This guy had a lot of possessions. And because of that, this guy, he, he got sorrowful because he had great possessions and they had a control of him instead of him letting the Lord be Lord over all of his life. Well, that's important. We've got to keep the commandments of the Lord and we can't have anything that's going to hinder us from following the way of the Lord. The things of this world are only here for a season. We're not taking them with us. They're here for you to use what God has and you want to be sure you're using them for the Lord. We see also in Matthew 19:29. It says, everyone that has forsaken houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my name's sake, shall receive, lombano, take hold a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. What's that tell you? Everlasting life is part of your inheritance. And you are to do some things that will enable you to take hold of the hundredfold and to be able to receive this and shall, to inherit eternal life. It's part of your inheritance. Well, what's this tell us? If we're going to forsake houses, brethren, sisters, mother, mo father, uh, mother, wife, children, lands, that means we're not going to let anything be before us in serving the Lord. 
you know, houses, that's not going to stop me from serving the Lord. Brethren doing what they want, sisters, mother, father, wife, children, anything, nothing is going to stop me from serving the Lord. In other words, I must forsake all. If I will forsake all and serve the Lord and put him first place, then I'm going to be able to take hold of a hundredfold and I am going to be able to inherit everlasting life. In Matthew 25, you see quite a statement made from verse 31 and following. This is where the Son of Man says he's going to come in his glory and all his holy angels with him and he'll sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him is going to be gathered all nations. Here's when he comes back. It says he'll separate from them, them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So he's got all these ones and they've got the sheep, he's got the goats. Now, when he talks about this, remember what he's talking about. He's, he's going to separate these ones that are all, the, all these ones from the nations. He's going to set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left hand. Who are the sheep? The sheep are the ones who are following him. Who are the goats? The goats are the ones that aren't following him. Goats just wander off and do whatever they want to do. What do sheep do? Sheep follow the shepherd right on the heels. They do exactly what he says. They hear his voice. They're close to him. They're following him consistently, not just once in a while. Consistent followers of the Lord are sheep. Goats, they don't follow him. They just go their own way. Now, he comes and he says, Then, comes, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand. Who's the ones on the right hand? That was the sheep. Those are the ones who are following him. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You can get your kingdom, inherit this thing. This is going to be the result of you having followed the Lord as a sheep. He says, For I was a hungered, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw thee a stranger, and took thee in naked, and clothed thee? When saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch that you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. Otherwise, you've been out ministering to other people. You have done it unto me. When you do it unto another, you're doing it unto the Lord. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, These are the goats. They were doing their own thing. They weren't following him. Depart from me, ye cursed. He says, these guys are cursed into everlasting fire. Ah, oh, they're not saved, are they? Prepared for the devil and his angels. What about these guys? For I was a hungry, and you gave me no meat. Thirsty, you gave me no drink. Stranger, you took me not in. Naked, you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger, a thirst, or stranger, naked, or sick, or in prison, did not minister unto thee? He said unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. That means God wants us to serve him and to be ministering to other people. We can't be living our own life unto ourselves. We need to be ministering unto the Lord and following him. These shall go away into everlasting punishment. They're in trouble. You can't be a goat and be saved. You can only be a sheep. But the righteous, into what? The righteous are called the sheep who are following him, did what he said. They enter into life eternal. Over in Luke, Luke chapter 12, in verse 15, we see something else. He says, take heed, beware of covetousness. Covetousness is a greedy desire to have more. I want, I want, I want. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Your life doesn't consist in that. Your life consists in all the things that you have of God. What's your possessions don't, that's not, that's not having the life of God whatsoever. The covetous are in trouble. In fact, what do we know about those that are covetous? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10, when it's speaking about all those ones of the unrighteous ones that won't inherit the kingdom of God, it says, don't be deceived. The fornicators, the idolaters, the adulterers, the feminine, the abusers of themselves, of mankind, which is a homosexual, the thieves, the covetous, the drunkards, the revilers, the extortioners, shall not inherit the kingdom. Who's included in the group? The covetous. We cannot have covetous. The love of money 
is the root of all evil, which some have coveted after. Remember what it says in 1 Timothy 6.10. We can't be coveting after love, loving money. We don't want to be coveting after things. <laughs> there are only two things that God tells you to covet after in the Word. He covers, tells you to covet after, to covet to pre prophesy, and to covet after the best gifts, as it says in Corinthians 4, 12 and 14. You can covet after those things, but you don't ever cover after things of this world or anything that is not of the Lord, after, after things. Therefore, we shouldn't have any of this. Uh, this is going to hinder us from entering into the things of God. We certainly won't enter into the life of God. Look what he even says in Ephesians 5, 3. Fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. We're to be holy. Now, if this has been named among you, you should have confessed your sins, received forgiveness, cleansing from all unrighteous. He forgives you and cleanses you. From this point on, don't ever let it be named once among you. It goes on in verse 5. For you know, this you know, that no whoremonger, no unclean person, nor covetous man who's an idolater. That's why you can't be looking at other things as a source. God's got to be your total source. You're to be content in whatever state you're in. Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? You have no inheritance. You're not going to enter into eternal life. You are not going to be saved. They're going to be in trouble. We see over in John chapter 3, verse 36, he speaks about the fact that he that believes on the Son is believing, a present tense verb, and how do we show that we're believing on him? We're following him. We're doing his word. We're carrying out what he says has everlasting life. But he that is not believing not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Hearing his word and doing his word it shows the fact that you are believing on the Lord. Believing, when we've done a study, we've done a teaching on this before, and we believing is not just the fact that I just believe mentally. If I really believe, then I do what he says. I carry it out. That's why he says, why, why call me, me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? If we're just a hearer only, that's a guy who certainly believes in him, but we don't do the word, we have a great fall. The one who hears the word and does it is the one who's going to then have a foundation, and he's going to, of course, walk in victory in his life. Notice the guy, the wrath of God will abide on him if he's not walking in the ways of the Lord. In John chapter 4, in verse 14, Whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. The water that I shall give him, which is what? The Word, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Again, the Word in you is producing a well of spiritual water, so to speak. The Word in you that is going to spring up as it's coming up from within, bringing forth everlasting life. We see something else in chapter 4, down in verse 36 where it says, he that reapeth receives wages, or he's going to get rewards, and gathers fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and re he that reapeth may rejoice together. God wants you to be a laborer for the Lord. You're going to be sowing seed. You're going to be watering seed. And you may be reaping the seed. If you've watered but haven't reaped, that doesn't mean you're not going to be rewarded. When the reaping occurs... Everybody who's been involved in it, the sowers, the waterers, and the reaper, will all rejoice together, and they'll all then receive the rewards. That's why we want to be a sower of the truth, giving the gospel, preaching the gospel to people, watering it in people's lives. Regardless of whether they respond, you still need to be giving it to them. And then, and when they're reaping, then, of course, everybody is going to see the results of that. In John chapter 5, we see in verse 24... Verily I, verily I say unto, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me. Again, this is tied together where the believing is referring to you responding to the word. He's was hearing the word continually, not like he heard it once. Not like I heard it once, got saved, and then went and lived my own life. No, the guy was hearing his word continually. That means he's seeking after the Lord, hearing his word. And is believing on him continually present tense, meaning he's doing what he says. If you believe something, you're going to carry it out. You're going to do it. On him that has sent me has everlasting life. He will not come into the judgment, condemnation of the judgment, but he's passed from death unto life. 
that you are past from death into life if you are doing these things. So you should have confidence that you have security and eternal life. You just want to be sure you continue in it. Don't ever turn away from it. It's interesting what it says down here in John chapter 5, verse 29. It speaks about those who are going to come out of the graves, they're going to hear his voice, and it says, those are going to come forth, they that have done good. Now, this also comes showing your works. Those that have done good unto the resurrection of life. But those that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. What does this tell us? That if you're really believing and you have his word in you, you're going to be doing the word. You're going to be working the word. Remember, the doer of the word is a doer of the work. You're working out your salvation. You're carrying out the word of God. So, the things that you're doing, it's not your good works in your own ability. It's the doing the Word of God. As you're doing good and doing the Word, you're going to come to the resurrection of life. But if you do evil, what's going to happen? The resurrection of damnation, of judgment. That's why we cannot be walking in evil ways and think that we're going to be entering into eternal life, the life of God. No. We need to be walking in His ways. Now, what's going to be the source? John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They are which testify of me. Unfortunately, the Jews didn't receive Jesus. He says, you will not come to me that you might have life. Who's the source of life? Jesus. The scriptures were all pointing towards Jesus, all the prophecies about him, and they weren't listening. They are they which testify. They think they have eternal life. Well, that's true. The scriptures do produce eternal life, but you've got to come to Jesus. You've got to do what he says and, of course, get born again. The Jews, unfortunately, stumbled at the stumbling stone, which was Christ. In John chapter 6, over in verse 27, labor not. The word labor means to work. Don't work for the food. Process is food. Translated meat, but means food, which perishes. But for the food, the spiritual food, that endures unto everlasting life. Everlasting life comes from the Word again. This is why the more that the Word is in you and you are working to get this Word in you and carry it out in your life, then it's going to endure to everlasting life. In John chapter 8, <clears throat> we see down here in verse 12, Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That's the Word the Word of God in you. You're going to walk it out. That's why you can't have the talk. You've got to have the walk. You can't be hypocrites. We've got to be doers of the Word. That's why God knows us by our fruit, doesn't He? Let's face it. If you're really following the Lord, it's evident by your fruit, by your walk. You're not just saying one thing and going and doing another. He calls those guys the hypocrites. No. We are going to be doing the things that He says. We're not going to be walking in darkness at all. In John chapter 10, comes along verse 27, and he says this, My sheep, remember the sheep that are following him? Hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He knows those are the real sheep. He knows those that are listening to his voice. He see, everything he sees what we're doing with his word. And he says, they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life because they're following him. They shall never perish. Why? Because they're following him. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, or any, any pluck them out of my hand. Some people try to say, see, you never can go out of the hand, hand of the Lord. Well, that, wait a minute. You've got to look at the whole context. It's talking about the sheep that hear his voice and know him and follow me. How about if you decide to become a goat and you quit following him? Are you going to have eternal life? No. Are you going to be plucked out of his hand? Yeah, because you chose to depart from him in the sense you're not really plucked out of his hand. You left his hand, let's put it that way, because you're not following the Lord. Sheep are on the heels of the shepherd. Goats, eh, I'm not following him. I'm going off my own way, do whatever I want to do. Then we're in trouble. John chapter 12, verse 25 tells us something else. It says this, He that loveth his life shall lose it. This word lose again is destroy it. What type of life are we talking about again? The suke life. And when it talks about loving, this is not the word agape. This is the word phileo, which means to be fond of or to like. Those who are fond of their soul realm life, I like to do whatever I feel. I like to do what I think. I like to do my way. I like to choose what I want to do. I like to think, you know, the way I want to think and do all these things. 
you're going to destroy it. You'll absolutely destroy it. But he that hateth his suke life, I don't want to do what I want to feel. I want to do what I might think that I want to do. I don't want to do what I choose to do if it's not in line with God's word. I hate this soul realm life to direct me. No, I'm not going to do That's in the world. He's going to keep it or guard it. This word philoso means actually to guard it unto life eternal. Therefore, you've got to guard the life of God in you. If you let your soul start running the, running the show, and I'm fond of running my life according to what I feel, what I think, what I want to do, my choice, you're going to destroy it. You'll destroy the life of God in you. But if you hate your soul realm directed life in the world, you're going to guard it, and you're going to keep it unto life eternal. That's why we cannot walk after the flesh, and we cannot walk after the soul. We can only walk after the way of the Spirit. Verse 50. I know that his commandment is life everlasting. What produces life everlasting? His commandment. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. You know, Jesus didn't speak anything of himself. He only spoke what the Father told him. And he just spoke the word of God. That's what God wants us to speak. The commandment of God, all the commandments of the New Testament, are going to produce life everlasting in you and me. In John chapter 17, we see over here in verse 2, As thou hast given him power or authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. God will give eternal life to those. And he goes on and says, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Knowing him, that is what produces eternal life in us. There's a lot more to talk about in the New Testament, which we're going to be talking about, but we're going to jump down. We'll be picking because we've got a lot to co cover tonight. So we're going to be going through the New Testament. There's much that are, we see that are conditions showing for entering into eternal life. But we want to go over and look at some in Revelation before we conclude for this morning. Revelation chapter 2. This is to the church. And he says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that is conquering... The word overcometh is the word nakao, which means to conquer and carry off the victory. To the one who is conquering and carrying off the victory in his life, and this is one who just didn't do it one time, he's continually doing it, and why would we be continually doing it? Because we're walking the way of the word, and God's given us victory left and right over every situa situation. Will I give to eat of the tree of life? So this is important, that you and I, are consistently conquering the enemy. God's going to give to you to eat the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Praise God. We're going to partake of that tree of life. He goes on and he even talks about the guys here that in, there'll be some that will be martyred in the end. And it speaks in Revelation 2.10 about these ones where the devil would cast some of them into prison that they might be tried. He said, you'll have tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. This life will be like a crown of life that's going to be given. And for those that are faithful that would be martyred, in the end, they will get a crown of life. In Revelation chapter 3, we see another statement about this conquering, where it says in verse 5, He that overcomes or is conquering, carrying off the victory, nakao again, the ones who are conquering, carrying off the victory continually, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. We're going to have white raiment. That's of righteousness and holiness. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. There is a book of life. Notice, he says, I won't blot your name out. If he says, I won't blot your name out, what does that tell you? You could get your blood name blotted out. Can somebody get their name blotted out? We say, I don't see how anybody could get their name blotted out. They sure can. Look what happens to the guy down here in Revelation 22, 19. If you take any way, away anything from the words of the book of this prophecy, God's going to take away his part out of the book of life. You're going to be blotted out. Therefore, people that sit there and say, you can't be blotted out, not so. You can be blotted out from the book of life. We, got, we don't want to be blotted out, of course, from the book of life, and we won't be if we walk in his ways. But notice what he says. The one who's conquering and carrying off the victory. God wants us to conquer. How are we going to conquer? Through the Word. 
Who's the one that accomplishes it? The Lord does. Thanks be to God who is giving us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, who always causes us to triumph or conquer in Jesus Christ. We always can tri triumph in every situation. In fact, he expects us to do this. Look what he says in Revelation 21, 7. He says, he who is conquering continually shall inherit all things. Yeah, we want to inherit everything. The kingdom, everlasting life, eternal life, all the things that God has for us. And I'll be his God, and he shall be my, my son. At the same time, if anybody who, during the tribulation period, takes the mark and worships the Antichrist, he is in trouble. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, talking about the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. They're not written there, or if they were, they've been blotted out. They're not there any longer. You cannot be worshiping the Antichrist or yielding to him in any capacity. You even see it down in Re Revelation 20. It talks about this book of life. Revelation 20, 12 says, I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God. The books were open. Now, there's books, and then there's a book of life. The books it's speaking of here is all the recordings of all the things that you and I have ever done in our life. Everything is recorded. The books were open, and then another book was open, which is the book of life. That's a different book. And the dead were judged out of the things that were written in the books. That's all the books that are showing all the deeds that we've done throughout our life, according to their works. That's why you know it's a recording of all your works. Your, the books are going to be open. They're going to find out, ah, here's the books that tells about all your works. You're going to be judged according to all your works. The book of life, well, of course, our name must be in that or we're going to be in trouble. So we can, of course, be with the Lord. What happens if the guy's name's not in the book of life? Revelation 20, 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Turn, eternal torment. That's why we've got to walk the straight and the narrow way. In Revelation 21, look at verse 6. He said, I'm the Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that's a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He gives it to us freely. All we've got to do is come and take hold of it through his word and do what he says, and walk it out in our life. At the same time, look what it says down in verse 22. It talks about, I saw no temple therein, talking about this is in the New Jerusalem, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, the new city that's going to come. The city had no need of sun, neither the moon to shine in, for the glory of God did lighten, and the Lamb is the light thereof. The nations of them which are saved, there'll be nations that'll be saved, that'll choose the way of the Lord, shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations unto it. There shall in no wise enter into it, though, anything that defiles. It can't be. We've got to be totally holy. We can't be unclean. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination, anything that's abominable in the sight of God. Or we'll do a message one day on all the things the Bible says is what's an abomination. We can't have that or we're in trouble. And maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those are the only ones that are going to enter into the city. In fact, when we do see this heavenly city, verse, chapter 22, verse 1 of Revelation, he said, He showed me a pure river of water of life, like a water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. It's going to be tremendous. It's going to be phenomenal to see a, be, be in this state. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. The tree of life will be there in this city. And you and I will be able to partake of that continually. And bear twelve manner of fruits, which yield your fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, no more curse in the New Jerusalem, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. We are going to serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. It's going to be a tremendous place. There'll be no night there, no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and he shall reign forever and ever. He's going to rule and reign. He says these things are all faithful and true, all these statements that he makes. Well, he says, blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. We want to be ones that are keeping what he says to do. And we come down here, and he says in 11, though, he says, He that's unjust, let him be unjust still. 
God's not going to make a person come to the place of being just. He tells them what to do. We've got to be sure that we're not going to be unjust or unrighteous. He that's filthy, let him be filthy still. He that's righteous, let him be righteous still. He that's holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward's with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. We're all going to be rewarded according to our works. That's why what you do is so important every day of your life, doing the things that God wants you to do. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that are doing. We saw this verse to begin with. Blessed are those who are doing His commandments. They shall have right or authority to the tree of life. If you are doing the commandments, you have right to the tree of life, and you'll be able to partake of it in the presence of God and live forever and be with the Lord and may enter in, because they met the conditions, into the gates, into the city. But without are the dogs, the sorcerers, the whoremongers, that's anybody who's involved in sexual sin, the murderers, can't be a murderer, idolaters, that's a covetous guy, anybody that's got idolatry, you've got to get rid of everything out of your life that's not right. Whosoever loves and makes a lie, see, idolatry is anything that becomes a source. God's got to be our total source. We're going to walk in His ways. Whoever loves and makes a lie. What's going to happen? These guys are all, they're not going to be without. They're not going to be in the city. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify of these things. I'm the root and the offspring and the bright and the morning star. He says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that's a thirst, come. Whosoever wills, whoever's willing, let him take the water of life freely. It's available. It's in the Word. You and I can take it daily the Word of God, and do it and keep it and walk in the light of it and see the tree of life be built in us, see all the fountain of life coming out of us, see this life be manifest. We're walking the way of life, the path of life. We're seeing all God accomplish everything that He wants. He does say there, testify to every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. People that are adding things to the Word are in trouble. Any man takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and the things that are written in this book. This is why we've got to meet the conditions for entering into the eternal life. And we see, as we go back to verse 14 again, the one who is doing the commandments, that's the one that shall have, as he said, that means it's a set statement. You shall have authority to the tree of life. God said it. It's going to happen. If you are consistently doing the commandments of the Lord, you have the right, according to God's word, to be able to partake of the tree of life, and you will have met the conditions to enter into the gates, into the city. And that's where we're headed. See, we're seeking after these things. In fact, there's a scripture over in Romans that we talk about where what we're seeking after, we've got to realize he comes down here, it's back in verse, uh, it says he's going to render to every man according to his deeds, in Romans 2, 6. To them who by patient continuousness, which means steadfastness, those who are steadfast in well-doing, in their things that they're carrying out, they're working in life, what are we doing? We're seeking for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. This is why you want to be steadfast in doing the things that God wants you to do. In doing that, you're actually seeking for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Make your decision every day. I'm going to seek after doing the things that God wants me to do. I'm not going to waste my time doing things that are worthless or sinful or worldly or anything that's of the flesh. It's going to lead me down a path of destruction. And I'm going to end up seeing I'm not going to be rewarded for any of those works whatsoever. And I've got to be sure that I'm a sheep and I'm following the great shepherd. I'll never be a goat or I'll be in trouble. Well, God wants us to understand how we enter into the eternal life of God. What's this tell us? There's all kind of conditions, aren't there? All kind of conditions. If you're following the Lord, you're going to enter in. We looked at the first part of this and we're going to pick up here. We'll look, go through Acts and go through the rest of the New Testament. And you're going to see a whole lot of things more that are brought forth throughout the New Testament of conditions and things that are necessary to enter into eternal life. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. 
I thank you for your word that brings revelation of how to enter into the eternal life of God. I see that I must do what the word says and walk in the ways of the Lord so that I will be a sheep following the great shepherd. And as I choose the way of life, as I walk that path, as I get the word in me and gain wisdom, as I walk in righteousness, as I watch my mouth and only speak what God wants, as I am being able to be corrected, open to correction, ready to repent, as I gain understanding, as I walk in the fear of the Lord, as I am humble before God, as I'm following after righteousness, as I am crucifying the flesh, destroying the soul realm directed life, and walking in the spirit, keeping the commandments of God in the New Testament, cutting off the sin of the members so I'm not cast into fire, as I forsake all, as I get rid of covetousness, as I'm a believer of your word and hearing your word and believing in you and doing what you say, as I'm working in the ministry for you, as I'm following you, as I am doing what you say, I am going to see that I am going to enter in. Because as I do your commandments, steadfastly and well-doing, I'm seeking for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. And as I do your commandments consistently, I have the right to the tree of life and I will enter into the gates of the holy city and I will be with you forever and I will inherit eternal life. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to follow you and do what you say. And I'm going to enter into eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. It's a powerful message. If you're not walking right, it'll really make you uncomfortable. It should make us uncomfortable to jerk the slack out of our life so we get in line. Well, there's going to be a lot more. We'll be going through Acts and all the rest through about another 50 scriptures or so or more. Tonight, we'll be covering this. If you can't be here, you can get it, but I'll tell you, it's a very important message because we want to know everything the Bible says about how we can enter into eternal life. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We'll be hearers and doers of it. We'll see the fruit of it because we will enter into eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.